Good morning. It's time for us to begin, but before we do, we have a few announcements. Shortly, Kyle will be reading from Colossians 2, 6 through 8. Colossians 2, 6 through 8, if you want to be turning there. Jim will lead our opening prayer this morning. Fred and Dan will lead us through the Lord's Supper Memorial, as well as offer the prayer for our giving. And Don will lead us in our closing prayer. Jamie's back this week. It's good to have him back, and he will be taking care of the technical functions the audio and visual booth. This evening at 5 p.m., we encourage everyone to be back at the building for worship services, and tonight's emphasis will be on singing, so all song leaders and first-time leaders, be picking out a couple of songs, and uh, you'll have an opportunity to do that tonight. Wednesday at 7 p.m., we will meet at the, beating, at the building once again. JC is scheduled to present our devotional lesson, and Brett, will be leading our auditorium Bible study. These will also be live streamed on YouTube for those who are unable to attend. Commodity collection for Perigold Children's Home this week is paper towels, and next week is snack cakes. I think they left snack cakes to the end for a reason, so that you weren't tempted with them back there for the full month. Ladies' Day at Pacific has been rescheduled for Saturday, August 29th, with Carolyn Stevens speaking, so you may want to add that to your calendar, ladies. And please check the bulletin for a complete listing of those needing our prayers at this time. Penny Leibner's post-procedure follow-up went well. She's still very weak, due to, very weak due to the infection and has a lingering fever, so please continue to pray for Penny as she recovers at home. Becky Cochran's CAT scan confirmed an eroded and swollen esophagus. She's scheduled for an EGD procedure in August. And it's, it's a word this long, there's no way I'm gonna try. The Whites are at home to ensure everyone is healthy following their travels. They plan to be here next week. Additionally, Michelle had an EGD, must be popular this time of year, last week, and everything checked out fine for Michelle. J.C. Owens is worshiping from home as a precautionary measure since Rankin Tech, where he teaches, has closed its Wentzville campus due to concerns uh, that the faculty and students may have been exposed to the virus. So please remember J.C. and his family in your prayers, and hopefully everything will check out fine there uh, at Rankin as well. And Jan told me this morning that Connie Eubanks remains at home, but she's now on a feeding tube. So please remember Connie in your prayers as she continues to recover. This time we'll begin with our scripture reading. Scripture reading is Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Thank you, Kyle. Our first song this morning will be Praise Him, Praise Him. Praise Him, Praise Him, Jesus our blessed
Before we go to God in prayer, let's sing, We Will Glorify the King of Kings. <clears throat> After this song, we go to prayer by Brother Jim. We will glorify. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, this day is a day of praise. It's a day when we gather in your Son's name, have this opportunity to sing songs of praise to you, to remember your Son, to remember all the great things he did while he was here on earth, and all the great things he has done and for us. We certainly thank you for his sacrifice, we thank you for his lessons, and we thank you for his example. And we thank you for his resurrection, for it is proof that there is a resurrection to come for all, and let us all be resurrected to life. We thank you, Lord God, this day for your Bible, for your word, for it allows us to understand who we are and who you are and what our responsibility is towards you. And we thank you, Lord God, that we have it. Each one of us can study it for ourselves, not take the word of others, as to what it says, but be able to confirm it and make it part of our lives. We thank you, Lord God, for the strength that we get each day from you, from the memory of your Son, for our desire that we have to be with you one day in heaven. Let that be our driving force. As our love grows, let it be always a love that is focused on you, that we use all of our being to uh, honor you and to fear you and to love you. And let us in turn love those around us. We certainly love those that are gathered here this morning, our brothers and sisters in Christ, the people that uh, we care so much for, that mean so much in our lives. And we pray for those that are not able to join us this morning because of all the difficulties and the problems and the viruses that's going on in our, in our country. We miss them and hope that they'll soon be able to reunite it with us. But we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity they have to join us uh, electronically. For all those that are with us this morning, we thank you for tuning in and, and being part of our worship service. We pray for those that are ill. We certainly think of Connie, think of Becky, we think of Penny, uh, Cindy, and, and uh, Kelsey, and so many others that we need to keep in our prayers. And we thank you for those who are doing better and that have been healed or, or certainly been treated to where their health is improving. We think of uh, Randy and many others that have um, shown better health and strength and pray that, uh, that that will continue for them. We always come like this together seeking your forgiveness. We pray that uh, those things in our lives that are causing us difficulty those things that we can uh, trip over and, and stumble and, and fall from grace, we pray that those things we'll truly repent of and put aside. 
and that your forgiveness will be with us, that the blood of your Son will continue to wash us. We ask you to watch over this nation. It was a nation that was founded under you. It's a nation that for, for centuries has uh, tried to be a nation of, of righteousness. Not all believe in you, but we have a t- tradition of understanding just how important you are in this nation. We're losing that, and we pray that uh, it will come back. And we have a responsibility as your children to encourage others and teach them and help them to understand who you are and how important you are and how important their souls are. We ask you to be with the leaders of this nation and that they will turn to you for guidance and, and strength. Help us each day, O oh Lord, to be an encouragement to others and to be concerned about uh, their souls. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Our song of encouragement after Brother Jerry's lesson this morning will be, I am resolved. And before his message, let's sing unto thee, O Lord. And will you please stand as we sing this song? Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Please be seated. The books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John remind us of who Christ is and why he came into this world. The book of Acts reminds us of how that we can become a follower of Christ. And then beginning in the book of Romans through the rest of the New Testament reminds us of how that we ought to live and can live as a follower of Jesus Christ. And so the emphasis in that last section of books in the New Testament is upon the child of God being steadfast, being faithful to the Lord, no matter the situation or the circumstances that one may find themselves in. In Philippians 1.21, Paul said, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
We know as we study the life of Paul following his conversion that, that Christ was the very center of his life. Christ was the focus of his life. He went forth preaching Christ to those who need to hear that message. And whatever happened to him in life and whatever circumstances he found himself in, he did not lose sight of the new life that he was now living. And as he spoke to King Agrippa, he reminded him that his desire was that he be as he was, that his Agrippa to be as he was, and that simply meant to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Paul was a Christian in action, in fact, no matter who he was with, no matter what was happening to him in this life. He didn't change, he didn't deviate from that at all. And we see the, the great statement that he made, and we're reminded of that, and we reference that often in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6 through 8, what he was looking forward to one day. Open up your Bibles to the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians is a book that certainly emphasizes Christ. In fact, in the book of Ephesians, the book really emphasizes the church of Christ. But the book of Colossians, really the emphasis is upon Christ. It's upon Christ. And Paul is writing to encourage the brethren not to leave or not to depart from Christ. Don't be let off. Don't be led astray. Don't be deceived into thinking there's someone else or something else that you need to be looking to to, to guide you and to direct you in life. And so the book of Colossians reminds us of the capacity the power, if you will, of Christ. It reminds us of how that completeness is found only in Christ. The book of Colossians reminds us of how that we can become a changed individual, spiritually speaking, because of Christ. And it reminds us of how that there is consolation, uh, certainly that is found in Jesus Christ. And so, so the emphasis in the book is upon Christ Jesus the Lord. Direct your attention to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. We'll be looking at a few verses from this chapter, also from chapter 1, as we deal with this subject this morning. Let me again remind you of the scripture reading Kyle read for us a few moments ago. He says, as ye have, this is verse 6, chapter 2. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Rooted and built up, notice, in him. And establish in the faith 
as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. In this section, Paul reminds us of the importance of being in him, that is, in Christ, and the importance of us to stay firmly rooted and grounded, if you will, and built up in him, that our faith can be established, our faith can be stable, if you will, because of the instruction, because of the teaching that we have received. And therefore, because of that, that will lead to then a life of thanksgiving. Paul gives a warning in verse 8. You see, as he mentions already in this chapter previously, that there are some people who are out to beguile you or to deceive you, and they're trying to lead you off, if you will. They're trying to lead you from Christ, and they'll do so with enticing words, King James says. New King James says, persuasive words. And so beware of that. Beware of that. So here it says, beware. Beware. Lest any man spoil you. When you think about the word uh, spoil, you think about food, fruit, you know, vegetable, whatever becomes spoil. We think about that which is corrupt or that which is, as we would say, rotten, okay? No good, throw it out, throw it away. Well, the word spoil here really doesn't have reference to that. It has reference here to, to plunder. It has reference to here to, to rob, to take away. What Paul is reminding them here is that it's possible by these enticing words or persuasive words that people speak to you, they can deceive you to the extent that they can lead you off. They can, in a sense, capture you. They can rob you of that position, of the place that you are now in, in reference to Christ, through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. They're leading you off. They are, in a sense, capturing you. They are taking you captive away from Christ. I want to emphasize three things in our lesson this morning. As you think about remaining faithful to the Lord, in verse 6, we are talking about here the walk that is demanded. In verse 7, we will talk about the way that is described. As we walk according to what he has demanded of us. Then in verse 8, yes, we have this warning that is declared and certainly defined, if you will, to the people. And so we're, we're basically going to look at these three points based upon these three verses. Let's look at verse 6. 
As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Notice the walk that is demanded here. There's a certain kind of life that we are to live in response to our having received Christ Jesus the Lord. In other words, you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. And in response to that, Paul says, here is how you are to walk. You are to walk in the manner in which you received Christ Jesus the Lord. Now, notice the words that he uses here. Christ Jesus the Lord. He is the anointed one. The prophet spoke of the Messiah that was to come. He is the Savior. And Jesus gave his life. When he was in the flesh, he gave his life. He sacrificed himself. He suffered, yes, so that we could have the hope of eternal life. And he is the Lord. He is the ruler. He is our owner. He is our master. And Paul says, you have received him. Well, how do they receive him? Well, notice in verse 7, he talks about instruction or teaching. You see, they listen to the faith, which is God's revealed will. And as the faith was declared, they accepted what the faith was preaching to them. And what was involved in that. In fact when you go back to Colossians chapter 1. You want to get a good picture. Of the idea of receiving Christ Jesus the Lord. That means we acknowledge. Who he is. You see we can't receive Christ Jesus the Lord. Through faith. That is by the the faith in obedience to the faith, unless we have faith that is produced in reference to who Christ is and what he has done. Now look in Colossians chapter 1. In verse 13, Paul says, who had delivered us, was we have been rescued. You were, yes, in sin, But you have been delivered from the power of darkness. You have been rescued from that. That didn't happen by accident. Christ is connected to that. Notice he says, And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You have been rescued You have been delivered. You have been relocated, spiritually speaking. No longer are you in the kingdom of Satan. No longer are you under the power of darkness. But you have been relocated into the kingdom of his dear son. In verse 14 he says, In whom... We have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In whom? That's Christ. That's Christ. You cannot receive Christ Jesus the Lord unless you acknowledge who he is and what he has done. He is the one that provides for our redemption. He is the one that provides for our 
for the remission of our sins. He is the one that provides for reconciliation according to verse 20 of Colossians chapter 1. And so there is redemption, there is remission of sins, there is reconciliation. And all that is in him, that is in Christ Jesus. Now notice in verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God? Is not that something significant about who he really is? And then in verse 16 reminds us that all things were created by him. And yes, and for him. In verse 17 he says, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. We're talking about Christ Jesus the Lord. Then in verse 18 it says that he is the head of the body, the church. And so verses 13 through 18 reminds us of who Christ Jesus, the Lord, really is. And talking about his power and talking about what he has given to us, what he has provided for us. And those things are found, yes, in Christ. And so when we talk about receiving, and Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6, about receiving Christ Jesus the Lord. And certainly that was done by faith, by obedient faith to the faith that was taught them, that they were instructed in. And so there is an acknowledgement of who he is. There is an acceptance of who he is to the extent that we won't want to make the application of that to our very life. Paul says, in the manner that you received Christ Jesus the Lord, that is by faith, and obedient faith to the faith, it is in that manner that you are now to walk. It is in that manner that you are now to live a life because of how you have been blessed by Christ Jesus the Lord. Walk. So, so walk as you have received Him. See, this is that response. To our receiving of him. To walk in a certain way. And that walk, that way of life begins with our being baptized. Colossians 2 verse 12. We are buried with him in baptism. And he talks about having been raised, having been risen. In Colossians chapter 3, he says, If ye then be risen with Christ. The idea there is that since ye have been risen with Christ, that's talking about what happens in baptism. Since you have been risen with Christ, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Seek those things which are above. You see... Because of our new relationship with Christ Jesus the Lord, here is how you are to walk. Here's how you are now to live. Yes, to walk in newness of life, Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 6. To walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, Romans 8 and verse 1. To walk by faith, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. To walk in good works, Ephesians 2 and verse 10. To walk in love, Ephesians 5 and verse 2. To walk in the light, to walk in the truth, 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. 
You see, that's how we respond in a proper way to having received Christ Jesus the Lord. In verse 7, he describes to us the way. Notice in verse 7 of Colossians chapter 2. Rooted and built up in him. And so as we begin to walk in that manner in which we have received him, Paul says, remember now, you are rooted. Yes, we are rooted in him when we obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, suggesting that of, that brings about stability, rooted in him. And the tense of that word is, is talking about a past action that continues. A past action that continues. You began to be rooted in him when you obeyed his word. And you have put on Christ. You are now in him. So you're now rooted in him. You're now rooted in the truth. And because you are, he says, here's what you need to be reminded of, that you are to continue to build yourself up in him. And this is talking about a continual action here. Not talking about one, some, something we do once in the past, but he's talking about continual action, built up. If you want to continue to be stable and rooted in him, you've got to make sure that you're properly building yourself up in him. And then he says, and established in the faith. Or established in the faith. Notice, it is the faith. Established. Established in the faith. He's talking about God's revealed will. God's complete will. Not talking about one's faith, but he's talking about being, being established in the faith. Now how are you established or established in the faith? He says, as ye have been taught. You have been taught, you have been instructed along this line. How you can begin to be rooted in him, built up in him, and have your faith established or established you know that, you have learned that by what you have been taught, by what you have been instructed. Suggesting to us, therefore, that a person cannot receive Christ Jesus as, as Lord unless the word has been heard and accepted. That also means that one cannot Continue to be steadfast in the Lord, to be faithful to the Lord, unless they continue to look at the teaching of the faith. The reason that people are not receiving Christ Jesus as Lord, as the Bible teaches, is because they have not heard the truth. Or if they have heard the truth, they have not accepted it. There is no one who has received Christ Jesus as Lord apart from hearing and obeying the faith. There is no one who is growing spiritually, who is developing themselves spiritually, apart from hearing and obeying the faith. And so this is done by the faith. And so as we hear, as we obey, what are we doing? We are developing ourselves spiritually. We're becoming stronger. And our faith continues to be certainly established. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. You see, thanksgiving, the life of 
those who have received Christ Jesus as Lord and their obedience to the faith, a demonstration of that, in other words, as they respond to that, is going to be a life filled with, as it says here, abundant thanksgiving. A person who goes around griping, complaining about anything and everything, they are demonstrating that they really don't understand how to properly respond to receiving Christ Jesus as Lord through the faith. Thanksgiving Expressing gratitude is a demonstration of the fact that we understand what it really means to respond in a proper way in our lives to what the Lord has done for us. Of course, we understand that in gratitude, Is a sin. You know, Paul says in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And giving thanks always for all things. Now that means as a child of God, as I'm looking at the walk that is demanded of me and the way that as has been described that I'm to conduct that walk, it involves thanksgiving. Every day. Pause and to think. I guess you think and pause. And to express gratitude to the Lord for who He is and what He has done for us. Will that encourage us to remain steadfast? Of course it will. The reason that sometimes people do not remain steadfast is they fail to stop and remember what the Lord has done. You know, Peter points that out in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 11. Remember as he talked about the Christian graces in that section of Scripture, verses 5 through 8? He talks about if we lack these things, we are blind and cannot see afar off. Or words, if we have not been adding and abounding these Christian graces, that means we're really blind spiritually. We can't see afar off. And then he says, and we have forgotten that we have been purged from our old sins. Being forgetful will lead to our failing to be steadfast in our walk with and for the Lord. There's a walk here that is demanded. The way he describes that we can show and demonstrate that we understand this walk that is demanded of us. All this is being stated to warn the readers that it's possible for you to be deceived and to be led off. Notice in verse 4, Let's go back to verse 3. 
He says, in whom are hid all the mysteries, of, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You're talking about the treasures of wisdom and knowledge? We need wisdom and knowledge. The treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And Paul is reminding his readers that that wisdom, that knowledge that you need to maintain this life that you are to live is found only in Christ. And so he says in verse 4, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. I'm telling you this. Don't. If you want to have wisdom and knowledge that will help you in this Christian life, remember where it is. It's in Christ. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. It's not found in worldly wisdom, but it's in Christ. You see how he's emphasizing? In fact, in verse 10, he talks about that you are complete in Christ. If we're complete in Christ, then there's not anything that we need outside of or away from Christ. Again, that's why the warning, and we'll stop with this, not get in discussing this right now, but we will later, where he gives this warning. Beware. See to it. Heed to this matter. Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ when anyone begins to say to you something to suggest to you or really Implying to you that, you know, Christ is not all that you need. He's not the world to you and should not be. Because you see, as some state and some believe that he, he's not perfect. He's not sinless. He really didn't know what he was doing when he came. Really. And that's why Paul is emphasizing in this section the importance of the faith. And making sure that what you are being taught, what you are being instructed in, is the faith. Yes, Christ is the all of our needs. And thus let us as we respond to him as a follower of his, let us remember and let us show our appreciation by walking in a way that he has demanded in the way that he's described here so that we will be ready to fend off, to defend, not to give in to the philosophies, the thinking of this world. This morning, if you're here and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, the Lord certainly desires for everyone to be saved. He's made that possible. He came to seek and say that which is lost, Luke 19 and verse 10. In Matthew 1, 21, and she shall bring forth a son, that shall, call, that shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. 
In Hebrews chapter 5, it says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience for the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Salvation is available because of what Christ has done. This morning, if you need to obey the gospel, come believing in the Lord, repenting of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and to be baptized, to be immersed in water for the remission of your sins, for the salvation of your soul. And thus you begin to walk in a way that brings honor and glory to him. If you haven't begun, we encourage you to do that this morning. If you have started that, and yet there are things that have hindered you, you made decisions and choices that are keeping you from maintaining that faithfulness and loyalty to him, then we need to do something about that. As the New Testament books, as most of them emphasize, it's not enough just to become a follower of Christ. We ought to remain faithful to him. And if we haven't, then we need to change. This morning, we'll have a time and opportunity. If you need to respond, we not come as God we stand and as we sing. Please be seated. Before we remember our Lord and Savior, let's sing the Lord's Supper.
I'll be reading from Luke chapter 22, verse 14 through 23. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table, and truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. Let us go to God in prayer for the bread. Dear most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have to partake of this bread, which represents Christ's body that was hung on the cross. Lord, we pray that as we partake of it, we will look back on Christ's life. We will look forward to his second coming, and we will examine our lives that we are worthy to partake of it. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you bow with me, please? Loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this time we could gather around this table to partake of these emblems. Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this fruit of the vine, which to us as Christians is Christ's blood shed on Calvary's cross for our sins. Help us to always realize the cost of our salvation and that we take this in manner well pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. We're also commanded to give. Let us pray. Dear most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you thanking you for our jobs, our means to support our physical needs. We pray, Lord, that as we give back, we will do so with a happy, cheerful heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to encourage everyone to be back again at 5 p.m. this evening. Thank Jerry for a fine lesson. And our final song this morning will be To Canaan's Land, I'm On My Way. Will you please stand as we sing this song? After this song, be led in prayer by Brother Don. It's good to see Cliff and Jonathan with us this week after their absence. So Cliff says he's feeling great. It's good to see him. To Canaan's Land.
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything you do for us. We thank you for the life that we have, for the country we live in, and for the freedoms we have. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to meet here as Christians, to worship you and study your word. Father, we thank you for your word and its power to, trans to transform our lives. Father, help us to learn, to grow, and to strengthen our Christian lives as we study your word. Father, we ask you to be with those who are on our prayer list. Uh, we have many with various needs, and Father, you know their needs, and we pray that you would help restore them to a reasonable good health. Father, we ask you to be with our shut-ins who are unable able to meet with us. Father, we pray that you would be with those who have lost loved ones, that you would comfort them. Father, we pray that everything that was said and done here this morning is in accordance with your word. Forgive us when we sin and help us to do the things that are pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> 